Welcome to the virtual edition of our wire wireless future event, Next Generation Wi-Fi, heading off a 5G digital divide with affordable connectivity for all. I am Michael Calabrese, director of the Wireless Future Project uh, at New America's Open Technology Institute. Um, it's of course, unfortunately, unfortunately we can't be in person with you all uh, here today, um, but uh, we wanted to make sure um, that you had the opportunity um, to learn more about this important uh, FCC spectrum policy issue that we expect um, uh, will be voted on uh, this spring uh, uh, by the commission. Um, it's of course, um, <clears throat> well, the race for 5G over the past few years has uh, focused on auctions for thousands of megahertz of high frequency and mid-band license spectrum. However, making 5G wireless connectivity and applications available and affordable for all Americans everywhere will also depend on opening large new bands of unlicensed spectrum capable of supporting the next generation of gigabit fast Wi-Fi, a new, a new standard called Wi-Fi 6. Building out mobile carrier 5G will be costly, will take many years, and will focus initially on urban and high traffic areas. In contrast, the next generation of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6, can make 5G capable connectivity available in any home, business, school, library, or public space that has a cable, fiber, or other fast fixed broadband connection nearby. The problem is that spectrum bands available today for Wi-Fi and on licensed public use are limited and increasingly congested. They are definitely insufficient to power 5G capable apps and services. The, the FCC is expected to vote next month on a proposal to allow Wi-Fi 6 to share 1200 megahertz of underutilized spectrum across the entire six gigahertz band. The six gigahertz band is currently um, occupied by high power fixed links, uh, fixed microwave links. Uh, that are used for telecoms, utilities, and other purposes. The Commission has also proposed reallocating 45 megahertz of unused spectrum in the adjacent auto safety band at 5.9 gigahertz to create an unencumbered gigabit fast Wi-Fi channel there as well. This new unlicensed spectrum from 5.9 across 6 gigahertz is necessary to make Wi-Fi 6 a pillar of a world-leading 5G ecosystem able to provide the gigabit fast and affordable capacity needed to connect billions of devices in smart homes, classrooms, public venues, and for enterprise IoT networks. So we will, we will go on first in terms of uh, a run of show uh, to start with an introductory presentation uh, by Priscilla Delgado Argiris, followed by uh, my conversation with FCC Commissioners Michael Riley and Jessica Rosenworcel. And then we'll conclude uh, with a, a panel, uh, John Horgan from the Technology Policy Institute will kick that off with an overview of digital divide issues. And then he'll be joined as well by Paula Boyd of Microsoft, Rosa Mendoza of Alvanza, and A.J. Phillips uh, from the Prince William County uh, Public Schools. So to get us uh, started, I would like to introduce Priscilla Delgado Argiris. Um, Priscilla is the Public Policy Manager for Connectivity and Access at Facebook and a former Senior Legal Advisor to Commissioner Rosenworcel for wireless public safety and international issues. High speed broadband access. 
and using Wi-Fi also and Wi-Fi to build other technologies, organizations can develop new innovative digital services and business models. And if you look at these graphics, you can see, you know, the value of Wi-Fi is estimated uh, in 2018 to be 499 billion in the US alone and almost double that is projected and it tracks the same type of growth globally. Uh, next slide. So, you know, Wi-Fi is an important complement to home broadband, which we all know, but it's also critical, it's gonna be a critical com complement to 5G. Um, right now, Wi-Fi supports the offload of 50, 4% of mobile data traffic, and this is set to grow to about 70% with 5G, as you can see. Um, next slide. So Michael mentioned Wi-Fi 6, which is the sort of next generation Wi-Fi standard, um, which is ultra fast and low latency. And Wi-Fi 6 and 5G, we expect will work hand in hand because without the ability to offload traffic to Wi-Fi, 5G networks will have to be more expensive and less efficient. Mobile operators would need to invest more in network densification, deploying more small cells in dense urban area in, a, in order to get that gigabit throughput. Wi-Fi 6 can support 5G use cases, such as HD video streaming, Wi-Fi calling, smart home devices, hotspot access, the automation of citywide services, AR, VR application, health monitoring devices, wearables, and seamless roaming. And as we've been talking about, robust Wi-Fi is really critical to bridging the digital divide. I think we're all living this with uh, kids that are switching to distance learning. Um, and you know, as Commissioner Rosenworth, my old boss, has said many times, 70% of teachers are assigning homework that requires internet access, even in normal circumstances. So Wi-Fi is a really important tool for anchor institutions like students, schools and libraries to close that homework gap for students that don't have reliable home broadband. Um, next slide. So we've talked a lot about why Wi-Fi is important and we all understand that, but what not everyone is thinking about is that we need more spectrum for Wi-Fi because the current Wi-Fi bands we use are getting congested. Um, as US operators are rolling out those gigabit broadband networks, you have to have really robust Wi-Fi in your home to be able to actually appreciate that, to get it to all your devices, to get it to multiple devices in a household that are streaming at the same time. And we don't want Wi-Fi to become a bottleneck to that user experience. It's also been more than 20 years since, since new mid-band spectrum has been made available for Wi-Fi, despite this exponential growth in traffic. And unless action is taken, um, the, we, there's estimates that the U.S. is going to have a shortfall of 1.6 gigahertz by 2025 that will impact businesses and consumers. Next slide. So um, this chart shows the 6 gigahertz band um, and the spectrum that's available and how that spectrum would be divided into channels. And what's so important about the 6 gigahertz band is that it can if the whole band becomes available for unlicensed use, that would mean 760 megahertz channels. And if you see below, it can show you under different Wi-Fi standards, what data rates could be achieved and how fast that could be. Um, just by comparison, Michael mentioned the 5.9 gigahertz proceeding, which is also super important, but the Wi-Fi in that, in that band, they're, they're looking to make 160 megahertz new megahertz channel available. So to really add a lot of those super fast channels, we really need the six gigahertz band. Um, next slide. So in the six gigahertz band, industry has been talking about three different device classes. And so the first would be a very low power, port very low power portable device class with a max sort of a peak 14 dBm ERP limit. Um, and this would operate both indoors and outdoors. A low power indoor device class and a standard power device class that would have automated frequency control. Next slide. So starting out with VLP, um, these are some of the possible use cases. Mobile AR, VR, uh, UHD video streaming, high speed tethering and in vehicle entertainment. And these are you know, two gigabits high throughput with very low latency and close distances. Next slide. 
So in terms of VLP, this is the space where you'd have next generation mobile peripherals, uh, critical 5G use cases like immersive AR, VR connectivity, and other advanced peripheral, peripherals would rely on 6 gigahertz VLP because of the constraints on battery life, form factor, and cost. And one example would be the connection between augmented reality glasses and a smartphone. Um, that would be a VLP device. Um, and something that you know, we've been talking about at Facebook is that AR, VR really isn't just, I think people think, oh, that's gaming or something like that. But if you think of now that we're all working from home, you can imagine, you know, you do feel that distance even with a video call. Imagine if you had devices in AR, VR that could really make you feel present at work and what that would mean if you could really work from everywhere for any company. And so that is something that we're talking a lot about. Next slide. Okay, six gigahertz also enables robust low power indoor use cases. And uh, those are high speeds, 1.4 gigahertz at seven meter distance, even if there are obstructions. Um, next slide. And then standard power use cases. That's like enterprise use cases, 20 gigahertz per, per second, outdoor coverage, parks and stadiums. And also there are opportunities for rural connectivity with multi gigahertz point to multi-point services. Uh, next slide. So, next slide, yeah, perfect. Um, so obviously the six gigahertz band, it's not greenfield spectrum. They're existing users and they're important users, uh, but we believe that this unlicensed use can be compatible with those existing incumbents. Low power indoor and very low power devices protect incumbent operations by design Low power and indoor only, low power in, is indoor only. It's, there would be rules that would require it to be plugged in, there were removable antennas and couldn't be weatherproofed and that would all ensure that these devices would be used indoors. Um, very low power has an extremely low radiated power and dynamic power control. And what that means is if you have on, you know, AR glasses, for example, if you're in a situation where there was less body loss, the power would automatically reduce because you need to save battery life. And so you would never have a situation where you're going over the peak power, but this added benefit of dynamic power control that you would have in battery operated devices would also ensure that you're always operating at the lowest power possible. Um, there are other elements in VLP, including body loss, antenna mix, mismatch, uh, that would help to prevent any harmful interference to six gigahertz incumbents. Um, and then lastly, the standard power six gigahertz devices would protect incumbent operations with automated frequency control. Um, the devices obtain a list of permissible operating frequencies from the AFC system operator. Uh, next slide. So in summary, the US really needs to act on unlicensed spectrum. Wi-Fi is the key to economic growth and societal development, key to achieving the US connectivity goals, it's key to 5G, and it's a key part of bridging the digital divide. Wi-Fi's full potential can only be realized with access to more unlicensed spectrum, and the six gigahertz band is really a perfect fit. The U.S. must act now to ensure six gigahertz spectrum is available on a technology-neutral, unlicensed basis as soon as possible. That's it for me. Thanks, Priscilla, in case that wasn't heard. <laughs> that, was, that was terrific. And uh, um, if, you're, uh, if you're able to, to stay around uh, at, you know, at the end, um, in fact, I meant to mention this, that we will have uh, a chance for um, audience uh, questions um, uh, at, the, at the end of the event, although um, I believe the commissioners will be willing to take uh, a couple, uh, time permitting. So let's move, let's move on to our uh, discussion with uh, commissioners uh, Michael Riley and Jessica Rosenworcel, because um, uh, we're, all, we're all anxious to hear from, from you both. Um, I, you, know, I, you don't need any extended um, introduction, except that, that I would like to, um, uh, to both make sure that everyone knows uh, you know, how much we appreciate 
um, the leadership that both of you um, have shown for many years in championing um, a vision of a wireless ecosystem that is, you know, balanced between um, licensed and unlicensed that has the full powers of both. And, and you've both really led the way in opening um, more spectrum at 5.9 gigahertz and across six gigahertz for the next generation of Wi-Fi that we're here to discuss. So this is really a, a, a very much part of a culmination of, of all your efforts for, um, uh, for, for years. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to, to recognize that. So to, um, I guess to get us rolling, um, what can you tell us about when the commission is likely to adopt the six gigahertz order and also how much additional uh, spectrum capacity can we, can we reasonably expect? Okay, I guess that's thrown to my direction first. I appreciate sure. like, being on the, on the call as well or on the, on the, the video. Um, I was very confident that we were gonna see an item very shortly. Uh, next month seemed a, an appropriate time. I'm not sure that events haven't changed that timeline. I haven't had a chance to talk to the chairman, so I'm trying to be respectful. It had been something that was teed up and, and working through the last couple pieces, and I'd like to believe that we can still make that happen, but I have to also be mindful of everything else that's happening and mindful of what type of commission meeting we may have. So uh, I, I'd like to believe that we can still make that in, in momentarily uh, and still be available next month. In terms of your second part of your question, uh, how much, uh, that's to be worked out. That's that, that's something we're working hard on. I have commented in the past about how much uh, I'd like to make the whole band available um, for the three purposes that, that Priscilla mentioned, try and work through all three scenarios, that they all be operational, uh, not one over the other. I'm certainly mindful, low power indoors, certainly really important to me, but all of them are important and, and they all have their benefits and will really help the community that's so needed uh, needs additional spectrum. So very happy where things are. I had a chance to see Wi-Fi 6E uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm, I'm really excited where things are. Um, there have been proposals, and I'm sure we'll get into them uh, to do some license to, in that portion. And I haven't find those proposals viable as of yet, but I'll keep an open mind. Mr. Rosenworcel? All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I co-sign and agree with everything my colleague, Commissioner O'Reilly just said. For starters, we do need to move fast. The 5G economy is underway and so much of the focus of our discussion has been on licensed spectrum. It's really important that we think about unlicensed at the same time. And the six gigahertz band is a terrific place to do it. And just like my colleague, I hope we can make as much spectrum available as possible in that band so that we see truly fast speeds and we see as much innovation as we can make possible. So um, I am hopeful we will get to this in April, but I, again, like my colleague, recognize that these are complex times and um, the agency might need to make some hard decisions. But I do wanna thank Commissioner O'Reilly because I know that he has been vigorous in championing that we move on this issue as fast as possible. And um, that's a large part of why we were planning to work on this in April. Okay. Well, as a follow-up to what you just said, um, I mentioned at the very opening that um, what many call the race to 5G has focused almost entirely on, on mobile carrier networks. And it's not even clear that many, you know, I think in this policy community, we understand the nuances, but, um, you know, the broader context uh, may not be as clear to many on the Hill and in other places. Um, do you view the next generation of Wi-Fi technology as part of the future 5G wireless ecosystem? And is it complementary? And I guess uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel can start since you're up. Sure. Sure, absolutely. Listen, I think Priscilla said it really well when she pointed out that 70% of 5G traffic is expected at some point to be offloaded onto Wi-Fi networks. So if we don't create more spectrum for Wi-Fi right now, what we're gonna have is these super fast licensed networks that are like being on a highway 
and then we're going to get off on a gravel road. And it will um, radically reduce our ability to do new and innovative things at high speeds with low latency. So it's uh, key for all of us to keep in mind that statistic that Priscilla offered, which is 70% of 5G traffic is expected to be offloaded onto Wi-Fi. It's why we've got to think about how we can have more unlicensed spectrum, and we need to do it now. Well, I would mm -hmm. comment, and I would say uh, I completely view these as complementary uh, and join my colleagues' comments and thank her for all of her hard work on these tough issues. We work together on a bunch of uh, matters, but these are two particular items, both 5.9 and 6 gigahertz, that I've appreciated her, her input, her thoughts, and her hard work on the matter. Now, to your, to your question, um, I, I certainly agree the point in terms of offloading traffic. Uh, that, that is a big point, but I just see a change in the communities, the, the folks that I've been working with for decades on the matter, um, a, a change of attitude. I certainly believe we're still going to need licensed spectrum, and I work really hard on 5G bands to make those available. But I also believe that we have to have a complementary full portfolio of unlicensed spectrum. And, and that's where you're seeing the licensed community change. In the past, it was a vicious fight um, between that, yeah, and now you're seeing a, an acceptance. That doesn't mean that every particular band is not going to have, you know, not going to be contested, but you're seeing an understanding of the value from both the licensed community and certainly the unlicensed community. So I think we're going to see, uh, you know, more uh, appreciation from the licensed community. We're still going to need licensed bands. There is no panacea going forward, and we're still going to have to work really hard, but they all complement each other. Okay. So... <laughs> and when that's a perfect uh, segue to the to, to my next question, which is that, you know, in real time, we're all, we're all grappling with school closures uh, in a majority of states, including the nation's largest school districts, that could dramatically uh, worsen what uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel has uh, for many years called the, the homework gap. Um, would you... Um, would you support the use of emergency funds uh, to pay for Wi-Fi hotspots, waivers of E-rate restrictions, or any other measures uh, that could help families uh, get through the shutdown? Just an opportunity to kind of address the, you know, what's going on, uh, <laughs> you know, right now in front of us in terms of uh, the connectivity crunch at home. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel, do you have? But I think if you start talking, yeah, we'll sure. Switch to you. Listen, um, as a nation, we're heading online like never before. I, we've got nearly 40 million school children who've been told that their schools are shuttering, and millions of them have been told to go online for class. This is a huge experiment in remote learning that this crisis has made necessary. But it's also exposing really What's hard truths about the scope of the digital divide, what I call the homework gap. So many students need internet access for nightly schoolwork, but data from the Senate, from Pew, from lots of folks proves time and again that so many students don't have that access. And now, with everyone expected to work and learn at home, we have a crisis on our hands. And I think the FCC should use every emergency power it has to step up and make sure its E-rate program can cover the cost of Wi-Fi hotspots for loan in our school libraries so no child is left offline. I think we should mirror our efforts on what was done following Hurricane Katrina during the Bush administration when we made a lot of really big decisions really fast about how we could use our universal service programs to keep folks connected. Now's the time to do exactly the same thing because we could fix this homework gap, but we've got to move fast. Well, I would say uh, uh, it's, I'm incredibly mindful of the circumstances uh, just before me in my own personal life, but also talking to uh, countless people over the years. The need to expand broadband accessibility uh, is a paramount priority for me. Um, I've worked really hard to try and address the unserved population and make sure that the commission stays focused on that to really get broadband to everyone who doesn't have it today. And we can, we can disagree over the numbers of how many people are not connected, but we know that that population is significant. And whether it's one person or 50 million, it doesn't matter to me. I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity uh, to, to access the broadband. In terms of the 
uh, uh, the immediate crisis that, that we face. I'm willing to look at anything that's available. I know that we don't have the authority to waive the statute. That's something that Congress can do. And I know that they're looking at some of these things and we'll have the opportunity to, to consider those, uh, those policies changes. So in, in, in working with my, my former uh, employers, uh, hopefully we'll be able to find a policy that works for everyone uh, um, in, in a very short order. Okay. Um, any thoughts about, you know, sort of to add on to that, um, telework, which is becoming uh, at least, you know, sort of immediately a new normal uh, and you know, could th this could change the degree to which it's done um, even after this, uh, even after we get through this crisis. There's a um, very interesting article just today in the New York Times um, ab about um, how there could be, you know, millions of homes with, uh, you know, even with good cable internet, where you have two adults trying to do video conferencing for work in addition to children, hopefully doing school work, but maybe watching their own video. Um, now, I know you can't wave a magic wand and, you know, um, and say that all this additional unlicensed spectrum is available immediately, but, but you know, I think it's a, a good thought experiment that if Wi-Fi 6 and access to the 5.9 and 6 gigahertz bands were available now, you know, would this connectivity crunch be less of a problem? That's such a good, that's such a good point. Look, we are in the middle of a crisis right now. And I, like everyone else, wants to get to the other side. And when we do, I hope we take measurements of where our network succeeded and where they failed. Because it's not simple getting connectivity to everyone's household. You could have challenges with backhaul, with interconnection points, with the last mile, and of course with our home Wi-Fi systems. In addition, you could have platforms we all use to communicate that might be overloaded. You could also have virtual private networks that enterprise use for telework that really were not made for the load that they're gonna have in the coming weeks. So I hope when this is all done, we can look back and identify those points of failure. And I think when we do, we're gonna learn that we need more Wi-Fi and the six gigahertz band is a really good place to start. No, Riley, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I would I would certainly agree with the the points my 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 fellow colleague made. Um, I, I might say I would I would compliment it and say if we're going to learn a lot. Uh, lessons learned will be both positive uh, and there'll be some negative. And at any point in the communication network, there may be a breakdown because of of load uh, and demand. Um, and that's something we'll have to explore going forward and what are those within our authority and others that are that are outside our authority. So there will be lessons learned, uh, good ones, and a lot of up, uplifting will be done from the magical things that the people were able to do during this time. Um, and there'll be some sad uh, stories that we'll have to deal with that will change policies going forward. So we're gonna learn a lot um, and we have a lot to do. Wi-Fi will play, is already playing an incredible important role um, in connecting consumers uh, and enterprises today um, and in this moment that we live. And so I'm really appreciative of what, what's come before me, the work that's come before me, the things that I might have done in a different life. And now I know all the work that's in, that, that we have to do on 5.9 and 6 gigahertz. Um, those are heavy lifting things. I, I've been there from the beginning and I'm, I'm very pleased to, uh, that we're all getting close to, to completion. Okay, well, on a more uplifting note, uh, we've talked about education. What other use cases are, you know, when we look uh, ahead, what other use cases are you most excited about as you've been supporting this big increase, increase in unlicensed spectrum capacity, um, you know, which could accommodate wide channel gigabit fast Wi-Fi 6 technology? Uh, I th Commissioner one of the things that I think is most exciting is we're going to see the growth of the intelligent edge. The uh, processing and storing all of the data with centralized cloud or, or data centers is no longer going to be necessary as we move to this new network infrastructure with Wi-Fi 6. And we're going to push decisions closer to the senses, sensors that are in the world around us, to the video cameras, to cars, to all the devices that are going to be connected. 
And that's going to create a new way of thinking about machine learning. And we're just in early days of understanding the impact of moving network intelligence to the edge, but I think it's going to be huge. I, I would uh, agree, and I appreciate all the points that Priscilla made in her presentation. The, one of my old bosses said it well, you know, the beauty of Wi-Fi is you don't know exactly how it's going to be implemented by the innovators, the, the entrepreneurs, um, where they're going to exactly take the technology. We have ideas on what may happen in very low power situations or the low power indoor or even at the standard power with an AFC. We have ideas on what may happen. But we're going to be surprised by something that, that, that we weren't anticipating. And that's, that's a wonderful outcome uh, for consumers. There's going to be some, some magical uh, cases coming forward and things that we never thought about uh, in the past. And really the synergies that can come from this technology in all three different tracks are really going to be exciting. Um, so I'm really interested in seeing this move forward as soon as possible. Okay, great. So uh, to a new topic, our panel uh, in a bit, we'll focus on the digital divide and Wi-Fi's role in narrowing the gap. Um, I'm wondering if, um, uh, if, if you are concerned that mobile carrier 5G may be limited initially and for some years to the, to the more um, you know, dense urban and high traffic areas that justify the high build-out costs. Uh, you know, creating potentially a, a, a new type of 5D, 5G digital divide rather than closing the divide we have today. I mean, is that a, is that a concern? Absolutely. Listen, I mean, it's a, a fact of nature that our private sector actors are gonna to choose to deploy first in the areas that are most profitable. And when you build out a network, that's where you start. That's math, that's accounting, that's a law of nature and we're not gonna change it. And then hopefully we build networks that we can then deploy further and further. But I think policymakers can do things to help ensure that the 5G error reaches us all. We need to be smart about spectrum for one. And I think we have got to make sure that we release to markets for both licensed and unlicensed use, mid-band airwaves that have a nice mix of capacity and propagation because they don't require as many terrestrial of the population reach over a period of time. And then we're going to have to make sure that more unlicensed is available, like we're talking about here, because that is the lowest cost way to extend service. It democratizes access, and it is a terrific thing to do, not just for innovation, but for the economy as a whole. I would join my colleagues' comments. I might have lost a little bit in there, but I'm sure she said some wonderful things, uh, and I would agree with her on them. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm really excited uh, on what, what we're in the, the places where Wi-Fi can can fill um, and its role that it will play. I agree that 5G wired uh, wireless services are probably going to deploy uneven. We've already seen that with the companies announcing different deployment schedules, many of them in the urban markets um, to start with. That makes complete sense, absolutely. Um, there are things that the commission has to do, and we, you know, Chairman Pai has been very aggressive on the infrastructure side, and Commissioner Carr has been working on some of those things. And there's more things that I've called for, and more aggression that we need to be um, towards some of the barriers in that, that situation, whether it be state, local, or tribal. There's some really hard work to do. Um, it's not beloved, I admit. Um, it doesn't make as many friends as people would like to say. It does require preemption. Um, and that's hard lifting, I acknowledge, but it has to be done. And then on the spectrum side, I agree with my colleague. Mid-band spectrum has been key. I've been working incredibly hard on C-band, working hard on a number of different bands, and then 3.1 to 3.55, a lot of things that are in the pipeline. And we also have to build the next pipeline because there's going to be an incredible need for new wireless spectrum going forward or, or, or spectrum bands that are already allocated for, for many purposes on the government side. They're gonna to need to be convert, converted to the commercial side. And that's a heavy lift as well. And that's what we signed up for. Um, it's what I envision the next couple of years will be at the commission. Um, it's gonna be hard decision-making uh, and hard to work with our, with our colleagues, but I think we can make some success in it. Okay, thank you. Let, let... Let's um, turn to uh, a debate that's flared up a bit in recent weeks. The, uh, the Mobile Industry Association, CTIA, has suggested that the top half 
of this gigahertz band um, could instead be cleared and auctioned for exclusive use. Uh, that would involve moving tens of thousands of, of fixed links, the point-to-point -point microwave links who are the incumbents and other incumbent users up into the seven gigahertz band. Is that, um, is that feasible or desirable at this, at this point? Um, you know, Commissioner O'Reilly, yeah. Well, I, I alluded to this earlier in yeah. my first and I know we're going to get to the, to, the, to the question. Look, I have kept an open mind on this issue, and, and, and I'm very mindful that the wireless uh, industry needs more licensed spectrum. So I've tried to uh, analyze this thoughtfully and look at the different proposals that have been put forward. Here, I've said I don't believe at the current time that what the wireless industry has sought, the licensed community has sought, is, is viable. And you mentioned 7 gigahertz, moving folks from six gigahertz to seven gigahertz. And I say, okay, explain to me, is DOD ready for that? Are they willing to accept new, uh, new, new, new licensees, new neighbors? Um, and I haven't seen anything that suggests that as yet. I, I've also talked to a number of the current incumbents and I've asked them, you know, a number of the utility companies. And I said, well, are you interested in moving to seven gigahertz? Are you, is this something that would be of, 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 of interest to you? And, and quite frankly, I think they're, you know, the initial story, you know, the initial take is that they're more interested in working with um, the unlicensed community to make Wi-Fi 6 uh, acceptable, Wi-Fi 6E uh, operational. So that, that's my initial take on the situation. I will continue to hear the dialogue on this, and if nothing, something changes, I, I want to reconsider. But that, you know, the viability of that plan is not exactly uh, fulsome at the current time. Okay. Commissioner Rosenworcel, anything on this? Well, I, uh, I agree with my colleague. I think he stated it very well. If speed is your primary goal here, that we get more unlicensed spectrum to the market, then we've got to recognize that relocating the incumbents in the six gigahertz span is a project that could take as much as 10 years, according to our history. Whereas with unlicensed, we can figure out ways to uh, frequency coordination and having low power where we can accommodate existing uses and get this into Wi-Fi 6 fast. So my, um, my concern is that setting aside uh, a chunk of these airways for license spectrum would be a slow process and in the marketplace we wouldn't be able to use them for could be many years. In addition, I think it would put us at odds with some of the uh, efforts going around nation uh, around the world, where uh, at least the lower portion of this band being looked at in Europe, and I think the UK, or unlicensed spectrum, and uh, we would of course benefit from harmonizing and building an ecosystem for devices where our use cases or our use of that spectrum for unlicensed is similar. Right. Yeah, I believe it was at the WRC, primarily Huawei in China, that was you know, pushing for us even to look at um, potentially yeah. licensing up in the upper right. six gigahertz. Yeah, no, um, I think it was, um, there was a push by uh, China for, I think it's region two, which involves Europe and Africa to study the use of this band for licensed airwaves at the next ITU gathering, uh, which could be 2023, in other words, that's a long way out. I like the idea of us using these airwaves for unlicensed and finding a way to do it fast. And that's why I think uh, moving ahead in the six gigahertz band uh, in the next few months is so important. Okay. Well, I, I agree with my colleague and say, I, you know, I had a chance to be in Egypt for the WRC. Um, and I will tell you, you know, my experience where those countries were seeking to disrupt US Wi-Fi experiences and to slow our success globally um, and, and disrupt that process. And so, so those companies you mentioned, the countries you mentioned are, are more disruptive than it was about strategic actually licensing uh, and being thoughtful going forward. So I found the process very distasteful. It actually colored um, I think the whole WRC um, and, and has made it problematic going forward. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so Priscilla described three uh, general categories of, of Wi-Fi 6. Um, outdoor use at standard power that would be controlled by the database, or any standard power use would have to be database controlled to protect incumbents, but also 
uh, low power, lower power, indoor only, and very low power for you know peripherals like headsets or glasses uh, with AR, VR, etc. Um, do you think the commission will be able to accommodate um, all of you know all three categories of use case? I'll, I'll take that to start. I, I don't see my colleague right at the moment. Um, yeah, go so, ahead. so uh, I think that all three tracks are necessary, and I think that I, I appreciate the the unlicensed community working together and not fighting amongst each other to try and make one track over another track. So I think all three are are, are necessary uh, and inevitable, and will be part of our item whenever it's considered. Um, I think it has to be. Um, there, there are different services that can come from them uh, and, and the benefits that, that from each one we're, we're yet to see, um, but there's no one right mode. I would say the only thing on the AFC side is I'm hopeful that an AFC will be a little scaled down, not as extensive as the SAS structure um, that we have at 3.5. I'd like to believe it could be something we can do uh, a little uh, le less uh, comprehensive. Um, I'd like to believe that to be the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's I, uh, a general belief. Commissioner? I agree. Um, I think my colleague said it well. I'd also like to see low power indoor use throughout the bands. Our initial proposal was that only two bands would be eligible for that. And I think we could move faster and build a bigger ecosystem for the six gigahertz band if we allow low power indoor use across the entire six gigahertz band. Oh yeah, you're absolutely right. And we're, um, you know, that that's why you get the seven channels. And so I think that's something that is an uh, incredibly high priority uh, for the chairman and myself. And I think that's uh, hopefully where we're going to land. Yeah, well, we're, of course, pleased to hear that since our very broad based, um, you know, consumer civil rights, education, et cetera, coalitions have uh, made that our, our top uh, priority, really, for the general public. Um, so, you know, building on this, um, I'll ask Commissioner well, both of you, but Commissioner Riley, I guess, to start. So on the AFC, right, at, at, at standard Wi-Fi power levels, there seems to be a consensus that the commission should require an automated frequency coordination system to control access and ensure no harmful interference to the thousands of fixed links. Um, so um, database sharing, I mean, in, in some ways, this is been a bit of a surprise uh, because database sharing was so controversial just a few years ago. Why isn't this dynamic sharing more controversial uh, in this proceeding? Well, my take would be that we have a, we have greater experience, right? We've done, you know, Yeoman's work to address a number of problems that we had on TV white spaces. We've done extensive work on 3.5 um, to make the SAS and the ESCs operational. Uh, and bring them up to speed. And so I think the experience has really calmed a lot of the waters from uh, incumbent users from DOD and other others. And so I think an AFC makes makes incredible sense for the certain power level that we're talking about, the track that we're talking about, the one track of the three in, in six gigahertz. Um, but I think it's also uh, mindful that we, we not overload that, that we not expect um, that, that, that it not be a, doesn't necessarily have to be a fulsome SAS type structure that we can build a, a less requirement and that not burdensome, uh, not be as expensive uh, as we've had in the past. So experience has helped us a lot. Um, experience on both sides, right? And making sure that it's not too cumbersome in the process. Okay. Yeah. Um, I um, I agree with my colleague again. Um, like pause and remember, it wasn't that long ago that it was perceived as totally radical to have a spectrum access system, and these things would never work. But here we are, and we've got proof of concept. We're demonstrating the possibilities in white spaces and in the 3.5 gigahertz band. And the best news yet is I think we can do it with a simpler system in the six gigahertz band. And I think what we're gonna do over the long haul is use more of these systems in more spectrum bands going forward. Because what we can do is we can take existing use cases and expand them, and we can move what we thought of as scarcity into abundance and that's really exciting and the fact that we have now gotten used to the idea that we might be using systems like these in more of our airways it's really important like you said it's a almost revolutionary switch in our thinking and um it's passing us by but we should pause and note mm -hmm. it's really important that it's happened and and, and i'd like to add uh, you know i think to your credit um that the fcc is again 
leading the world on this. Um, it, you know, Commissioner O'Reilly mentioned uh, that uh, the European Union and the United Kingdom, they are both about equally far along in opening, you know, the, um, the 500 megahertz at the bottom of six gigahertz, 5925 to 6425 for unlicensed um, sharing with fixed links. But they're, they're doing it initially indoor only uh, because they have no experience with um, using automated frequency coordination. And similarly, they're starting to open C-band spectrum for sharing for, for small enterprise use and so on. Um, but again, they're doing it through manual coordination, which is very clunky and limiting because they have no experience with this sort of leading edge uh, use of, of dynamic database coordination that we have in the US. So uh, again, I, you know, I think you should uh, <laughs> take some credit for leading the world on this. It's, it's going to be really important, I think, in the, in five, in the whole broader 5G ecosystem. It should be um, mindful that, uh, that it's, it's not just this commission, it's folks that have been working on this for a long while. Before I got to the commission, I give credit to my colleague, Commissioner Rosenworth, for working on this before I was there. And Tom Wheeler worked on it hard when he was chair. So it's been a long, long, a lot of work done. I will say that I visited uh, UK last summer and talked about some of these things. And they do have somewhat different path on, in their mind. I didn't exactly uh, figure out uh, some of the things. I didn't exactly agree with where they were going on some of the C-band things, for instance. Um, but, you know, they were not uh, exactly taking my, my, my ideas either. So we'll just have to see who's, who's right going forward. Okay, well, we're, we're almost out of time, but I do want to ask um, a last question on my end about the uh, 5.9 gigahertz uh, band. You know, comments were just uh, filed <clears throat> on that last week. Um, one argument we are seeing from the auto industry is that reallocating 45 megahertz to unlicensed and Wi-Fi is just a small increment that's not needed considering the far larger amounts that could soon be available uh, at six gigahertz. So I'm wondering, how do you think about that? I mean, you've both made 5.9 a priority. Is it really just uh, a marginal 40 or 45 megahertz or is it something more important? Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly? Well, look at 5.9 is incredibly important. I disagree with some of the auto industry and I wouldn't say it's the car manufacturers who have switched their tune over the last many years and so I think the the infrastructure side is still you know uh, committed to uh, a DSRC model and all 75 megahertz must be preserved and I, I don't think it's sustainable uh, going forward um, and I, I think that you know their approach is problematic they've been you know so much hyperbole on the subject is you know incredibly not helpful to, to the entire dialogue but I think that what you get from 5.9 is not something that's identical to to uh, six gigahertz, though they're really close. And we can put 5.9 to work immediately. There will be more work needed to make the AFC operational uh, in six gigahertz to deal with some of the things. So notwithstanding adopting an item, there'll be more work to have six, uh, to make six gigahertz operational where we can plug in 5.9 almost immediate. And so I think that's um, really telling um, and something that I think the auto industry as a whole or the transportation industry as a whole um, is missing on the situation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Listen, um, I think my colleague just said that very well, but I, I think there's a bigger macro issue here. Two years ago in appropriations legislation, Congress asked the FCC to find 255 megahertz of spectrum. And as much of that would be 155 megahertz below eight gigahertz for unlicensed use. So on the one hand, we have Congress tasking us with identifying airwaves that can be cleared for unlicensed use, and a lot of them, and that's a great thing. They understand, just as Priscilla mentioned, that this is big for the economy. Let's have more of it. But at the same time, we have a lot of federal entities that are incumbent users in eight gig below eight gigahertz. and um, they are pushing back on the agency whenever we try to reclaim those airwaves or even try to come up with ways where we can use them together. And this is not a problem that's unique to this administration. Frankly, it's as old as time. 
And on a going forward basis, for us to have a robust wireless economy with both licensed and unlicensed, we're going to have to get better at this because the back and forth slows down what we can do with these airwaves and slows down innovation. And I think we're going to reach the point where it slows the economy too. So this is a bigger picture problem than just what we see in the 5.9 gigahertz band. It is something that we're going to have to address at a higher level because uh, this back and forth uh, isn't getting us always the airwaves we need. Okay. Um, thank you. Well, I had uh, promised to, uh, to wrap up with you all by, um, by one. So I think we'll, we'll, have to, uh, we'll have to end it here. Um, but I want to thank you again for, for joining us under these unusual circumstances. And uh, we, you know, we're still uh, learning how to do this by, in, in virtual terms. Um, but I think it you know, went very well. So uh, yeah. uh, thank you to all. And here's a lot of virtual applause for you. <laughs> from our, <laughs> thank you, Michael. From our and thank you, New America. And um, thank you to everyone who's working hard at home right now, using their home Wi-Fi or trying to manage uh, keeping their kids quiet while we do these kind of things. I know personally, it's not easy. And um, just want to thank you for keeping this going and having this discussion today. Okay. Thank you. My thanks to everyone. Uh, have, have a happy uh, St. Patty's Day as best you can. Stay safe. Thanks so much. That's right. Thank you, commissioners. Um, that's something I Nico, forgot to do at the outset is wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. It's, it's so hard to remember when you're not seeing anyone dressed in green. Um, although I should, since I'm half Irish, believe it or not, <laughs> despite my last name. Um, so we can move on to, um, well, soon to our panel, but in, as a, uh, a sort of a kind of a introduction or setup for our panel, I'd like to introduce John Horrigan. Uh, John is a senior fellow at the, at the uh, Technology Policy Institute, where he focuses on technology adoption and digital inclusion. Dr. Horrigan is also a senior advisor uh, to the Urban Libraries Council. Um, so uh, John, take it away. Great, thank you very much to everyone. Um, I have a few slides that I think are going to get loaded and displayed in a minute. That's slide number one, we can go to the next slide. And what I want to do is just offer a fairly high level portrait of where we stand when it comes to the digital divide. What my focus is going to be is on internet adoption at home. So my presentation will not get into the deployment issue, uh, meaning I won't get into whether people's home broadband speed meet the 25 megabit per second per second threshold or not. Um, I'm just going to focus on what we know about how people uh, or whether people are subscribing to broadband at home. So in addition to this being St. Patrick's Day, it also marks the 10th anniversary of the delivery of the National Broadband Plan to Congress. And one of the things that is an outgrowth of a lot of the policy activity of that era is that the American Community Survey started in 2013 asking questions in its surveys about people's technology use at home. So that has become an incredibly rich data source on what's going on with respect to the digital divide um, insofar as we can now understand uh, who's subscribing to broadband at home, who's not, um, and even get down to um, the regional and city level to look at broadband adoption in those contexts. I'm going to keep it at the 30,000 foot level and just focus in this first slide on figures from the American Community Survey that focus on broadband of any type um, and the percentage of people with broadband of any type at home. And you can see over the 2013 to 2018 timeframe, we've had a steady increase in the share of people with broadband of any type at home. We've gone from about 73% in 2013 to 85.1% in 2018. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
on this next slide, we focus on American Community Survey data of, uh, that takes a different slice at who has broadband at home. In 2016, uh, the ACS started asking a question about whether people have broadband at home, um, such as cable modem, digital subscriber line service, or fiber optic service. That's a question that essentially captures the percent of people with a wireline broadband subscription at home. And you can see that the numbers are very different uh, than when you focus on overall broadband adoption rates. If you look at the 2018 number on the right, we see that 69.6% 69 of households have a wireline broadband subscription at home. If you can remember back one slide prior, you'll recall that in 2018, 85.1% of Americans had broadband of any type. So you have that roughly 15 percentage point gap between people having broadband of any type versus a wireline broadband subscription at home. For the most part, that 15 percentage point gap is the smartphone. People who have a cellular data plan uh, but do not have a broadband internet subscription at home. Now that gap is important because it is a measure of digital inequality. There's been um, a number of research undertakings. Uh, one of the most important, most recently, is from the Michigan State University, who show that having smartphone-only internet access is insufficient for completing a number of different tasks online. The Michigan State research, in particular, shows that households who are smartphone-only have students in them who are struggling to complete homework, uh, uh, have lower levels of digital skills, are less likely to take the SAT relative to those households with a wireline internet subscription at home. So the focus on the wireline subscription, I think, is an important metric for policymakers to focus on. And we turn, translate that 69.6% figure into households, that means that as of 2018, in the United States, we had nearly 37 million households without a wireline broadband internet subscription at home. And as I think many of us can appreciate, that wireline subscription is the big pipe off of which so much of our internet experience depends. And it's where wireline ends and for most households, Wi-Fi begins. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel set up a nice analogy that I'm going to play off of for this slide. Uh, she pointed out how um, some households have a super fast highway running to their homes. And then with Wi-Fi that may not perform so well, you get off onto a gravel road. Um, well, this first data point from a recent Deloitte survey shows that the average household has 11 wireless connected devices. So there's a lot of cars on that gravel road um, relying on Wi-Fi for their internet access experience and as the tool by which they use the various applications on these wireless devices. So the late report didn't break out how many low-income households have uh, uh, um, connected devices relative to well-off ones. But when you have an average of 11 wireless connected devices, it means that even low income households have a number of wireless connected devices uh, sharing the Wi-Fi internet connection at home. And in fact, according to a survey I did in 2018 of low income households, and this is a sample of Comcast Internet Essentials customers who had within the prior three months gotten a home broadband subscription, we asked them what kinds of devices they had, what kinds of things they do um, with their home broadband subscription. We found that 82% had smartphones, 59% streamed TV or, or video to their devices, 57% had a desktop or laptop, 53% have a tablet. So low-income households um, have lots of wireless devices, 
Um, I should point out also that the 59% number for streaming TV and video, obviously that does include entertainment, but we also found in that survey, um, which did uh, have an oversample of low-income households with children, that survey did find that there was a lot of streaming going on for educational purposes in those households. Um, let's turn for a second to Wi-Fi in community anchor institutions, and in particular, libraries. Um, work I did at the Pew Research Center a couple of years back focused on uh, how consumers or how patrons experience uh, um, various um, technology experiences at the local public library, and we found that 29% of public library patrons use the library or um, Wi-Fi resources at their local public library. That was most prevalent among young people and low-income people, and there was a high rate of people using uh, Wi-Fi or other computing devices at libraries for schoolwork, research, um, and uh, for, for healthcare applications. I wanna also mention some work I've done looking at public libraries in California. In the state of California, several years ago, public libraries were able to access the scenic research network in the state, which is a very high speed uh, internet connection that runs to public libraries. This increased the access speeds available at public libraries from something like 76 megabits per second to two gigabits per second or more. So libraries were going from uh, you know, bandwidth scarcity to bandwidth abundance um, overnight in some cases, and libraries had to consider what to do with this new wealth of bandwidth. Lots of libraries started interesting programs on gaming in their, uh, to bring people to libraries um, in their community to do gaming. Uh, they used uh, their bandwidth for uh, programs to import cultural content from some of the state's um, excellent cultural institutions like the Exploratorium or the Getty Museum in, in Los Angeles. So libraries started to close uh, what we t identified as sort of this bandwidth imagination gap by using bandwidth uh, for some of the services I just described but also relying on Wi-Fi within their libraries to really deliver those services. So libraries in California, at least, and I'm sure this is going on in other places around the country, are seeing sometimes very significant upgrades in connection speeds. They also need the next step, which is to have the Wi-Fi within their um, institutions to really get the most bang for the bandwidth buck that um, they're getting. Uh, next slide, please. And this will just be by way of um, wrapping up to talk about some of the implications of this. For a lot of people, the last few feet is as important as the last mile to their households. This is true in particular for all income categories. Wi-Fi 6 is part of another tech transition, um, but we have to make sure that the capacity exists to serve all segments of society. So there's an imperative, and we're seeing it obviously very vividly in these recent days with uh, people having to stay at home due to the pandemic, to work on the problem of home wireline broadband connectivity to um, lots of low-income Americans in particular, but then also plan for the future with a Wi-Fi experience that will make uh, enable people to get the most out of the bandwidth that they have at home. So with that, I will wrap up, Michael, and uh, turn it over to you. Thanks, John. That's, uh, yeah, that was terrific background. And, and I think, you know, for me, at least particularly reinforced, I, I wasn't aware of that scenic, uh, the California libraries and scenic um, uh, example, but it, but it really dramatizes that you know, you, you can have, you can bring multi-gigabit, you know, fiber to a community anchor institution, library, school, but if you can't distribute it to all the devices, to all of the people, then, you know, you're really not making uh, the most of it. And with 5G, applications will only get more bandwidth intense. 
um, obviously. AR, VR, the, the things that Priscilla outlined for us earlier. So let's move, move on then to include uh, the rest of our, our panel. And I'll just introduce uh, each one in turn for, you know, just a, a, a kind of a few minutes of, of you know, w their perspective on, you know, why are they and their organization um, so engaged on this on this issue, why is it important? So first, we have Paula Boyd, who is a, who is the senior director for government and regulatory affairs at Microsoft. And Paula, I want to um, you know I, th I think ask you about about Microsoft's interest in this because Microsoft's been such a leading advocate for unlicensed for more than a decade. Uh, um, and has been advocating for more unlicensed in low, mid, and high band spectrum, all of it. W why is this such a priority for the company and how does Wi-Fi 6 fit into your uh, vision? Sure, Michael, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate on the panel. Um, you know, as you mentioned, we have been, Microsoft has been involved in broadband discussions for a really long time. Um, you know, I, I, when I think about sort of the journey uh, that Microsoft and other companies have had from a, a technology perspective, um, unlike some of the other uh, big uh, tech companies, um, we were kind of born offline. You know, we, uh, you know, I remember the days when, you know, I got my software on a floppy disk and you had to download it to the computer, but over the years, you know, everything has shifted to being online. Um, you know, so your email is in the cloud, uh, your productivity tools today are in the cloud. Um, you know, we are leveraging the cloud to, to enable this, uh, you know, this, this discussion. And with that, you know, in addition to the ser our services that actually leverage the cloud, like Office 365, um, you know, Outlook.com and, uh, and other services, we're also a cloud service provider, which means that we uh, host um, services from other third parties in our cloud and allow their users, customers, employees to access their content and services. Uh, online. And so for us, broadband is critical for to that. Without broadband, there's no access to the cloud. There's no access to all of these uh, services. Um, and, and so from our perspective, you know, we have always, we have uh, uh, been very involved in the broadband discussion for, for some time. Um, as we, you know, in addition to sort of the policy efforts around broadband, we've also taken the opportunity a couple of years back to stand up our airband initiative in which we pledged uh, to connect, uh, I believe it's 2 million um, users um, unserved, uh, sorry, we, we pledged to partner with uh, broadband providers uh, to connect uh, consumer, to provide coverage, broadband coverage for consumers who don't have it today. Um, at least consumers in, in rural areas. Uh, and, you know, we've been working, uh, our project, our team, Airband team has been working really hard on those uh, issues and, and those project deployments. And, uh, you know, today, you know, they have uh, commercial projects in about uh, 26 uh, states, including Puerto Rico. And, um, and so they're they're well on their way on their way to delivering on on that pledge. So we we care about it from a policy perspective. We care about it from just getting you know our hands uh, um, you know into kind of the, the project side and working with partners to deliver on it. I think the six gig the the five G opportunity is is really interesting, and I think it intersects. Um, really nicely with, uh, you know, highlighting the importance of uh, ensuring that unlicensed spectrum is allocated across the six gigahertz band. Um, you know, 5G, you know, will mean greater band, you know, uh, applications with, with greater bandwidth or, or with greater bandwidth needs. Um, it will mean low latency. 
and today you know we are it's it's been amazing at least from my perspective what we've seen wi-fi do in other bands be it 2.4 be in, in five gigahertz but we know those channel sizes are, are um, a little smaller, at least in, in 2.4 gigahertz. And we just know that uh, those, those bands are becoming increasingly crowded. Um, so if, if we want to keep up with uh, um, being able to leverage Wi-Fi just in, in our daily life, I mean, you know, sitting here, I'm connecting via Wi-Fi today. Um, in order to keep up with that and, and to, to have new experiences as those experiences unfold with 5G and other technologies, um, it's going to be critical to ensure that uh, unlicensed spectrum is allocated across the, the six gigahertz band. Great. Thanks, Paula. Um, we're also joined by AJ Phillips, who is um, the Director of Information Technology Services for the Prince William County uh, Public Schools. And so I'd like to ask um, AJ um, just to you know, talk a bit about why is Wi-Fi important to teaching and learning in your school district? And, you know, is that ch a changing thing? Hi, Michael. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me here today. So, um, you know, Prince William County Schools is a large school district. We're the second largest in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we have 91,000 students. So every day I'm thinking about instructionally, how we support those students with Wi-Fi, with, um, you know, our network, ensuring that it's functioning. And I think our greatest struggle is that while 5G and um, Wi-Fi 6 are all awesome things that are coming, um, school districts struggle with getting their equipment up to date to pay for these types of things, right? And so what I'm always focusing on is, you know, students coming with more than one device to school. I mean, right now I'm sitting here with my iPad up, my phone going, and my laptop, right? Kids are coming with those same types of things. And so being able to support that kind of instruction on a daily basis for 100 different locations and 91,000 students is a challenge. And so not only that, we have voice over IP. You know, we have um, security cameras running on the network, robotics, um, online learning, you know, obviously the school closure is a huge part of it too. We have students trying to get onto, you know, VPN into the network and, and staff working. So, you know, this change to go to Wi-Fi 6 and the 5G would be immensely important for the school divisions across the United States. I mean, you got to think about other things just outside of the instructional piece. Our schools are trying to show, have Wi-Fi at the stadium. So parents who are maybe deployed or overseas can see their kids playing sports. And so we need that Wi-Fi access at the stadiums. Also, when parents come to pay, they go to the concession stand, they wanna be able to swipe a card. Well, we need Wi-Fi for that. So this is huge, a huge game changer for Prince William County Schools, for schools across the division. Um, I think one of our greatest challenges though will be once, if and when we get to Wi-Fi 6 and 5G, the challenge will be us as a division being able to fund those uh, upgrade our equipment to be able to max that speed, match that speed. Okay, thanks AJ. And um, our final uh, panelist is, um, is Rosa Mendoza, who is the founder, president and CEO of Alvanza. Um, so Rosa, can, can you tell us about Al Al Albanza's mission and how Wi-Fi and affordable internet access impacts the communities um, that you advocate for. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and first of all, thank you, Michael, and the Open Tech Institute for inviting me to take part uh, on this important dialogue on the future of Wi-Fi. Um, look, Alvanza's mission is to advocate to ensure everyone, um, especially those from underserved communities, uh, has a chance to succeed in our innovation and technology-based society. Um, I created Avanza for many reasons, but one of the reasons is because Latinos continue to be on the wrong side of the digital divide. Um, and although research has shown that Latinos use smartphones more than other groups of Americans, uh, as John Horton mentioned during his presentation, we need to remember that there's only so much you can do on a smartphone. 
Um, so we need broadband access on effectual devices. We need them where one lives, uh, where one works, in order to fully benefit from the many um, crucial resources available online. Um, and one of the many reasons why we at Alvanza care about Wi-Fi is because it represents a major mechanism to help close the digital divide. Uh, and because for too many people in the Latino community, uh, Wi-Fi represents their only way to access uh, the internet. Um, and you know, research has also shown that minorities use Wi-Fi more often than their white counterparts. Uh, and they do it for many reasons. I mean, education purpose, purposes, job searches, entertainment, and so on. Uh, and another important fact that research has also shown is that the number of devices that connect to Wi-Fi continues to increase. And that's not going to slow down anytime soon. Um, in fact, I just wrote a blog on this issue. And one of the statistics that I reference in that blog is that some estimates suggest that by 2022, there will be more than 13 internet-enabled devices per person in the US. And of course, many of which will be uh, able to connect or will connect to uh, through Wi-Fi, excuse me. Uh, and speaking of devices, uh, you know, that connect to Wi-Fi, my son, who by the way, is only two and a half years old, uh, already has an iPad. And of course that iPad connects via Wi-Fi, right? Um, I guess we just have 12 more to go, 12 more devices to go, <laughs> given the statistics, right? Um, so look, we, we all very much rely on this very valuable resource, and that's why it's very, very important that additional mid-band spectrum is allocated for unlicensed use in order to facilitate increased Wi-Fi availability. Um, without access to reliable, affordable, you know, internet broadband on effectual devices, like I said, where one lives, where one works, Latinos and other underserved communities are going to continue to find themselves on the wrong side of the digital divide. Um, so affordable, reliable broadband access is truly uh, the cornerstone uh, for underserved communities' achievement and success in our modern society that we all know has become very much dependent on innovation and technology. And as I mentioned, Alvanza advocates for this essential and what we believe should be a fundamental right for all people living in the U.S. All right. Thanks, Rosa. Uh, I wanted to pick up on you know, this uh, question of uh, a potential 5G digital divide. Um, as, as mobile carriers build out 5G, the promised gigabit speeds and low latency are expected to, to generate valuable new apps and services, much as 4G made Uber, Lyft, and live video streaming possible. Should we be concerned, you know, that for many years, 5G may be limited to the more profitable urban and high traffic areas, as Commissioner Rosenworcel was saying, uh, creating potentially a new 5G digital divide rather than closing the divide we have today. Um, so this is really for any of you, is that a, um, you know, is, is that something we should be concerned about? This is Rosa. I, I think that in order to ensure that 5G does not make the digital divide worse, it is obviously really important that 5G is deployed in every community in the U.S. to ensure that everyone can benefit from emerging technology that obviously enriches our lives in countless ways. But another thing that we need to think about is that, uh, and it's, this is something that we don't discuss often, uh, 5G infrastructure will create a lot of job opportunities. But unfortunately, a lot of people in underserved communities do not know about these opportunities and they have no clue what to do, what certifications to get in order for them to be able to get these jobs. So it's very important that the companies that are deploying and will be deploying 5G uh, create some sort of roadmap um, that can educate people about how to get jobs and deploying 5G infrastructure. Because people in our community need to know what type of skills they need, what, you know, if they need some sort of specialized training, certifications, uh, etc. Not only do they need to hear about these opportunities, but they need to know how to take advantage of these opportunities. And like I said, in order to ensure that everyone benefits from these emerging technologies, 5G does need to be deployed in every community, uh, in as many communities as possible, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say, I think um, it will be a challenge and it could create a little bit of divide because we currently still do have areas, you know, um, even where I live next to Prince William County, I live in Fauquier County where my daughter, you know, goes to school and they're in my, in my, I don't even live in a neighborhood. I live on that gravel road that John had mentioned, right, that you pull off of. We don't have internet. I don't have cable coming out here. I'm using literally a hotspot right now from home. And so 
I, what I am afraid is that that 5G is not going to work out here because we can't even get regular 4G or anything else to work out here. So that's always a concern uh, for me and for my students who live, I border right on Prince William County. I have students in my school district that live out here and they don't have internet access. So that is a concern uh, from a tech director's point of view and an educator that that could um, cause more of a divide. Yep. Mm -hmm. So th this is Paula. I'll, I'll also go ahead and jump in as well. Um, I thought uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel said it really well. Uh, you know, if, if, if the past is instructive, uh, these networks are, are challenging to build out and uh, build out often happens in areas that are uh, non-rural first, where that, those sort of high density areas. Um, but, you know, we know that. And so my hope is that uh, we can be intentional about anticipating the challenges for building out elsewhere and, uh, and, and putting in place, um, you know, private public sector opportunities to ensure that connectivity is, uh, is extended to everyone. Um, it's important you know, that uh, 5G is built out. Um, I, I think it's just a matter of making sure that we're intentional about uh, the gaps that might arise as that build out occurs. Okay. And if I might add quickly, Michael, I think mm -hmm. a data point I mentioned about the 37 million household gap in wireline broadband adoption at home, I think is worth keeping in mind in the context of 5G, which is to say there are two interrelated problems to solve, deploying 5G, but also tackling that home wireline broadband ad adoption gap that is particularly concentrated, not just in rural areas, although there are problems obviously there, but it's located in low-income urban areas and in communities of color in particular. So there are multiple problems we have to address as we move along this path toward 5G. Yeah, that, thanks, John. Yeah, and that's, that's certainly right, because when you, you, when you mentioned, I, I think it's a very sobering statistic too, is not only that overall gap in, you know, in fixed connections, but the idea that even, you know, that 15% that is mobile only, um, you know, they're not getting the full functionality of, you know, of fast broadband. And, and, and if they try to rely on, on mobile, on their smartphones, uh, no matter how fast those get, it's not going to uh, really give them a f the full opportunity of internet access. Yep. So um, kind of turning to education in particular, um, so even before the current school closures, um, an estimated one third of K-12 students had inadequate home broadband. Um, you know, so what, you know, Commissioner Rosenworcel calls the homework gap could now be, you know, a much bigger learning gap for as long as this goes on. Um, what role can Wi-Fi play, perhaps coupled with other policies to help students without good internet connectivity at home. Um, so maybe start with AJ and, and others can sure. chime in. Sure, yeah, I, I mean, the homework gap was definitely a concern before we're in the current situation we're in with um, COVID-19. Um, you know, definitely in Prince William County, um, we, we have mountains on one side and we're, you know, we're, we're next to DC on the other side and we have those urban areas and those rural areas where kids do not have Wi-Fi access. And it, it's a challenge. And so right now we're really struggling with trying to uh, ensure that instruction continues in these unprecedented times. And um, we're struggling with it. We really do not have the capacity to provide the internet that they need, um, you know, and some families just can't afford it, right? They can't Comcast, you know, even in, in a variety of other different um, providers, you know, lower the cost, but they, you know, parents will say all the time, well, we have a cell phone. And like you said, Michael, we can't continue to rely on the cell phone for our instruction and education. Um, they need more to, to their education. And, and, and so that is a great challenge. And a lot of our school, 
um, district, they just don't have access. And so we are concerned. We, we've been um, contacting numerous vendors saying, hey, can we get some hotspots and see if they'll work in the various areas? And, and at this point with um, the coronavirus going on, hotspots from the carriers are hard to find. Um, you know, they're saying, well, we, we might have some next week. Um, we're okay. Well, that's good. But, you know, and then it's trying to get them out there and make sure they work and show the families how to use them. So um, at this time, it, it's becoming wider for us in Prince William County Schools, the homework gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'll go ahead and jump in as well, Michael. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly, you know, it's certainly a challenge, but you know, I think Wi-Fi has an opportunity to provide some help. I mean, uh, talk about, AJ talked about hotspots. Um, you know, one of the things that we kind of learned when we did our, an airband pilot uh, in Southern Virginia is uh, it, in the pilot, we leveraged the uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, we leveraged the, the, the connectivity at the school to push out uh, um, connectivity to homes to students in their homes um, and you know when when we partner with our partners they use a lot of different kinds of spectrum to enable connectivity and and a lot of that is on license spectrum like 2.4 or 5 gigahertz um, and we we think there's a, there are opportunities there um, you know there's there's stuff that's done around the e-rate um, to make uh, connectivity in the schools available um, and our hope is that, uh, you know, one of the things that we have asked the FCC to do in the past is to enable um, uh, schools to, to make, make it clear that schools can use their E-rate funded broadband connectivity to connect students in the home. Uh, some of that can be done with unlicensed uh, spectrum, in, including Wi-Fi. So we, we think there's, there's it, it's, it's a tremendous tool simply because there are no barriers to, to being able to leverage it. And so we, we hope, and we've heard other, we've, we've heard about other creative solutions around uh, on license spectrum and Wi-Fi. So our hope is, you know, it, it's a really difficult time for a lot of schools right now. Our hope is that, you know, um, a lot of these ideas will bear fruit and, and folks will see value in, in enabling these uh, uh, solutions at time, you know, when we're not in the crisis mode, that, that it will last beyond this crisis and we'll be prepared if this ever, you know, happens again. Yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully they'll, they will uh, loosen some of the restrictions uh, for on E-rate funding, for example. Um, you know, because I, I think about, um, you know, not only your pilot, but also in, in the library space, the Gigabit Libraries Network has a pilot that was, um, has different federal funding, which uses um, unlicensed spectrum in the TV bands, the TV white space, to extend connectivity from the library out, you know, further into the community. Uh, because, you know, you may have a, a fast pipe to the library, um, but at best, you know, you know, given the hours of the library, sitting in the parking lot may be the only way to use it otherwise, and it can be extended further, and schools could be doing some of that as well. Yep. Um, let me ask, um, I think, AJ, in particular, um, you mentioned that, you know, so let, let's assume, uh, okay, we're, let's, we've been talking about the home, now we're back at school. Um, you mentioned that schools will need more and more bandwidth for Wi-Fi. Um, does this reflect changes? <laughs> in how internet access is used in teaching and learning. So for example, are you expecting more use of very high bandwidth uh, applications such as virtual reality? Yeah, I, so um, being a former educator and now a tech director, you know, I look at things and go, okay, we need to prepare our students for their future and not ours. And so there's gonna be two jobs in the future. One, one is gonna be working with computers and the other one's gonna be fixing computers. And so, we have to enable our students to be able to have those devices and those learning opportunities to be prepared for those jobs. And the only way we can do that is by increasing the bandwidth and ensuring that we have enough bandwidth and Wi-Fi to be able to support them. Um, 
I do see we already are our teachers, our principals are already asking me, hey, we need more, we need more bandwidth. We want to do, you know, virtual reality. We're going on these virtual field trips. Um, we want to, you know, chat with, um, you know, an author and, and things like that. And so, you know, with the bandwidth, with the division as large as ours, our bandwidth gets eaten up quickly with everybody streaming and different variety of things and creating their YouTube videos and doing morning announcements. And so, I, I always equate it to the field of dreams. If I build it, they will come. And so over the past couple of years, we've gone, we've increased our network. And the more I'm adding, the more I see that they're utilizing it. And, and no, we're not at our max, but we're getting there to the point where next year I'm thinking, okay, I already need to start adding on more bandwidth um, to, to, a, to enable our students and our teachers to be able to get the instruction across that they need to prepare them for their future jobs. Yeah, that's right. And if, if 5G networks make augmented reality and virtual reality something, you know, more commonplace and more affordable, right. I mean, that will, I'm sure that will become a tool in the schools. It will be well. a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts on, on that and schools, libraries, education? Because um, I'd like to go on and... Um, uh, circle back to Rosa. Uh, Rosa, you mentioned that Wi-Fi imp impacts everyone and so many important aspects of life in your community. Can you give us, you know, some other examples, some specific examples of uh, where Wi-Fi is uh, going to be very important? Absolutely. I have several samples that I'm going to share with you. But I want to start with a question, and this question is, I guess, for whoever can unmute themselves and say, I do. Um, <laughs> so the question is, uh, does your current laptop has an Ethernet port? I'm sure nobody's going to respond because mine doesn't. I can't remember the last time my device had an Ethernet port. Uh, and look, the point is that access to Wi-Fi is really the only way many people access the Internet. And, and that's why having increased Wi-Fi options through opening up unlicensed spectrum is very important to those who already have limited access and those who struggle with adopting NI resources. And I'm obviously referring to people from underserved communities, right? Um, and look, to answer your question, Michael, uh, here are some specific examples of why Wi-Fi is very important to the Latino community. Um, first of all, Wi-Fi is critical to the Latina student in the small town of Sunnyside, Washington, who doesn't have access to the internet at home and has to go to the local coffee shop, which is the story of many, many students from underserved communities, uh, to use Wi-Fi to be able to complete her homework. Um, schools and libraries also offer students access to broadband so they can complete their homework assignments online via Wi-Fi. Uh, in our communities, Wi-Fi is helping to bridge the homework gap and connect more people than ever to the internet. Um, Wi-Fi is critical to Oscar, who's physically impaired and uses smart home devices that help them execute critical personal and professional tasks. Uh, Wi-Fi helps the small business owners, the family in Wenatchee, Washington, who operate a taco truck, and Wi-Fi helps their business run more efficiently when they can easily and conveniently order their authentic Mexican food ingredients online from the Mexican bodega in California. And it also helps them attract more clients to their taco truck who need access to Wi-Fi on their laptop. You know, we all know that many businesses advertise that they provide free Wi-Fi as a way to attract customers. And I've been one of those customers. I've been to many places when they offer Wi-Fi because I, you know, I needed to use my laptop. Um, Wi-Fi is also crucial to the Latino farm worker in Salinas, California, who needs to communicate with his family members via social media about the financial support he sent via Western Union online to help his family in Mexico who needs financial support. Wi-Fi is important to most hospitals in the U.S. where many life-saving devices in hospitals across the country operate on Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is also critical to telehealth and for the 65-year-old Latino man who lives in Brown Brownsville, Texas, who needs to communicate with his doctor regarding his diabetes. And by the way, Brownsville, Texas is one of the least connected areas in the U.S. Uh, and there's a lot of Latinos in that area who are obviously not connected. And finally, uh, Wi-Fi was also helpful to me. You know, when I traveled to Europe, I was able to connect to Wi-Fi to let my family know that I had a ride safely. Um, look, I think these examples make it very clear that we all benefit from Wi-Fi. And, and that's why I keep saying that it's very important that the FCC allocate enough 
mid-band unlicensed spectrum for Wi-Fi operations, especially in the 6 and 5.9, uh, 5.9 excuse me, uh, gigahertz bands, uh, which yeah. will help close the digital divide by connecting people who otherwise would not have access to the valuable uh, you know, online resources. And as the number of internet enabled devices continues to increase, and like I said, that's not going to slow down at, at any point, uh, and it's happening across all communities, uh, the importance of Wi-Fi and obviously in turn, the importance of unlicensed spectrum will also increase. And today we simply do not um, have enough unlicensed spectrum available to meet not only existing demands, but also the future demands of Wi-Fi networks uh, with next generation uh, capabilities. Yeah, thanks. Um, John, you, you mentioned your research, um, you know, with library connectivity. Are there other community anchor institutions or civic applications um, that could leverage, you know, higher, higher bandwidth from next generation Wi-Fi? Um, you know, any kind of general thoughts on on you know on the on yep. public services and public access yeah um I mean, libraries are obviously hubs of access for people who do not have access to wireline at home or any access at all but there are a number of other kinds of community anchor institutions neighborhood nonprofits often fund, funded by local foundations that provide access services and they're doing things that um, AJ mentioned kind of matter of factly, but I think often goes um, unnoticed by some policymakers. AJ mentioned about the need to get um, hotspots to households right now. And she said, first you have to get them, but then you have to go out there to make sure they work and show people how to use them. That's part of AJ's job um, on a daily basis. But that is the function that a lot of these community technology initiatives uh, serve, not for students, but for um, older Americans or people who just can't afford broadband at home. So those institutions need a fast pipe coming into the facilities that they operate with Wi-Fi in order for them to deliver those digital skills services that they deliver to people. Um, that not just give them access for the sake of going online to check email, but gives them a pathway to um, apply for a job, build a resume, get that certification that they need to get that's often only available online to show that, um, for instance, they are certified to handle um, food safely so they could have food service jobs, for instance. So it's um, not just schools and libraries, but other kinds of community anchor institutions that are part of this equation as well. Okay, thanks. Any other uh, thoughts on that or? Okay, um, so another topic, um, and, and I should mention, by the way, if, uh, you know, those of you watching, if you uh, have questions for the panelists, um, you know, please, uh, you know, put them on the chat on the chat box and, uh, and we'll go to those in, in a few minutes. Um, but I wanna go back uh, first to, um, you know, Priscilla described how, you know, there's different flavors of unlicensed use across, potentially across the six gigahertz band. And um, as the two commissioners said that, you know, their highest priority, although it's the most contentious issue right now, is whether there can be lower power indoor only um, access, um, you know, or, or usage without the burden of database control. In other words, without having to worry about whether, you know, you have, you can tell, you know, you have the GPS to know exactly where you are or without subscribing to a database control service to protect incumbents. Um, because the way Wi-Fi works today, it truly is, you know, plug and play. You go to Best Buy for a router or you are drop shipped the router from your cable company, you plug it in, it works. If we want to add these bands um, to routers like that in the typical home or small business, um, you know, it, it can't be uh, burdened. So I think I asked Paula first and anyone else, when you consider 
that apps and use case, when you consider the apps and use cases um, are going to demand increasing amounts of bandwidth and low latency, how important is it for the FCC to authorize, you know, LPI, this lower power indoor only, in a way that the average, you know, household or small business can install it cheap, as cheaply and easily as upgrading a router? So it, I think it's really, really critical. Um, you know, we've talked about five five G offload, but you can imagine sort of a lot of the other examples that the various panelists have given over time could be enhanced and, and leveraged in terms of uh, the kinds of applications, the evolution in terms of applications, the high bandwidth that will be necessary. Um, you can imagine that once you know, higher bandwidth applications start moving over the 5G network, it's not, they're not only gonna stay on the 5G network, they're gonna be on the wireline network, they're gonna need to, to traverse over unlicensed spectrum. And today there's, there's, a, there's, not, there's no real uh, spectrum block there to handle that kind of traffic. So from our perspective, it's just really critical um, to enable, uh, you know, enable, uh, unlicensed allocation in the six gigahertz band. Um, you, when, you, when we think about, as a company, when we think about connectivity as well, we often think about our devices um, and our services being on devices that are, are, mo are mobile, I would say nomadic or portable. And so you're walking around the house with a tablet or a PC, um, you know, or you're doing that in the office as well. Uh, and, and the only, Primarily, those devices connect via unlicensed spectrum. And so if you're talking about moving really significant applications with interesting experiences that require low latency and high bandwidth, the six gigahertz band is just simply critical. Um, you know, I, I think of unlicensed spectrum as kind of an innovation band. You know, it's a per permissionless innovation. Anyone can leverage it and build services and devices that that uh, they can make available to consumers. Um, mm -hmm. I, I worry about sort of that innovation not happening if that band isn't there. I also worry about just the connectivity that consumers have come to enjoy not occurring if that band isn't allocated for unlicensed use. Yeah, that's right, thanks. And, and as much as uh, I think many people know that I've, I've been a big supporter of um, being able to share underutilized bands using databases. That's what, you know, how uh, it was mentioned earlier, that's how TV white space, um, we're able to use the vacant TV channels by coordinating through a, a database and knowing where you are located in relation to TV stations. And the same in the new citizens band radio uh, broadband service at um, 3.5 gigahertz to, that is shared with the Navy. Um, but if we can possibly avoid um, the need to have, um, you know, constant communication with a database and that, that database coordination, which has a cost associated with it as well, as well as complexity, um, you know, that, that, you know, uh, would make the band so much more useful in, in sort of every environment, even though it would be lower power. Um, is there any other thoughts on, um, yeah, on this, this question of, you know, kind of indoor, um, indoor, outdoor, or, or uh, you know, the, uh, uh, any constraints on use? Um, yeah, I know AJ said earlier, you know, obviously the schools have to move around all this data and the big schools can, uh, can probably install and manage an enterprise grade network. Um, but, you know, for the smaller schools, it will, you know, it'll also be important. Paula, while I have you up here, um, <clears throat> I also wanted to touch on, you know, rural, tribal, remote areas. I think we've all been talking so much about offload that it suggests, you know, heavily uh, urban, suburban use. Um, Microsoft's Airband Initiative has focused on leveraging unlicensed low band spectrum, the TV white spaces, to help connect rural and remote areas, including for agriculture. And what, you know, this, uh, something like 1,500 WISPs, wireless internet service providers, use 
predominantly unlicensed spectrum as well to connect homes and, and, and businesses in less populated areas. Do you see a role for wide channel Wi-Fi 6 in helping to connect rural and underserved areas? I, I do. Um, you know, when you look at the, when you look at uh, our partners in the projects that they uh, deploy, they tend to leverage a variety of spectrum bands to enable connectivity. Um, I, earlier, uh, um, you mentioned that when you look at the six gigahertz band, there will be, I think it was Priscilla who, who mentioned this, there'll be a number of different uses. So there's the very low power, uh, there's the indoor uh, um, low power, and then there's the standard power outdoor. And so when you, when you look at, if you think of broadband connectivity, particularly, particularly in the hard to serve areas, as a challenge that will probably require a number of different solutions, we see um, six gigahertz, uh, the standard outdoor power option as something that, that could be um, an opportunity for our partners as they uh, deploy in rural areas. Um, with that said as well, uh, you know, what's also important as well is that, you know, as new applications come on, you want those applications to be available to everyone. Um, you know, it, it limits your market size, it limits your customer base, it limits uh, consumer opportunities, and frankly, it has an, you know, an adverse impact on your ability to participate as a citizen um, if you do not have access to those kinds of opportunities and, and applications. So, uh, you know, so our hope is that, you know, it will come online and our uh, partners will be able to, to uh, deploy it where they see that it works best as they, they deploy their networks. Okay, thanks. Um, any other, uh, anyone else want to jump in on um, whether we need, uh, whether we can use uh, unlicensed spectrum out in, you know, out in these other areas? Um, I think it is important to realize um, it's kind of the flip side of the low power indoor because outdoors in these, um, less densely populated areas, you need higher power. And so the commission has proposed um, that you can use, you know, full the full Wi-Fi power, which is still fairly low um, in those areas, as long as you're um, controlled by the database to make sure you don't interfere with uh, fixed links. Um, and the WISPs uh, have proposed even higher power where there's more distance away uh, from the um, incumbents, which is typically the case. And you know, once you get outside, uh, you know, the very the very populated areas. Um, okay, um, we're uh, getting close to time. One one question that came in. I don't know if if anyone wants wants to do it. That this may have been intended for. Um, uh, the commissioners um, initially, but uh, but if anyone happens to be game, the um, the question is saying that the 5.9 gigahertz band is is not well suited for automobile safety to begin with. Uh, it doesn't go well around corners uh, or over hills, and now that it's sandwiched between the uh, the spectrum that is the future for Wi-Fi, why not give them a slice of lower band spectrum instead? Uh, maybe something, you know, um, you know, with much better propagation and perhaps even more spectrum. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to venture a, uh, an opinion on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and jump in, uh, Michael. Okay. Um, you know, we, we do support uh, a, a portion of the 5.9 gigahertz band being allocated for unlicensed use. Um, you know, I think we're anticipating that it would support, um, you know, multiple uh, 20 megahertz channels or 40 megahertz channel. Um, 
And when you aggregate that with the spectrum that uh, um, that is, you know, in in the other uni four in the uni four band, and then you in some that span the uni three band, with the right rules, it would allow you to kind of. Uh, leverage that additional spectrum and provide for additional uh, broadband connectivity. So we we definitely see that as a as as a a good opportunity. And uh, given sort of the scarcity of spectrum today, and given the reality that increasingly we've got to find ways to share spectrum, just because spectrum is is increasingly limited, we think that it's it's a good opportunity for unlicensed. Uh, particularly as you, you're going to be able to leverage sort of the technologies that are being deployed in uh, nearby bands and, and build off of that technology. So you can get to market quickly um, and at, at, at a, you know, a, a more decent price point than, than completely greenfield spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can add that, you know, our consumer um, coalition has taken the position and we filed you know, comments on this last week um, saying that it could be a bigger win-win for consumers if the, you know, auto safety, if auto safety communication could be moved. Uh, for example, there's a, a almost empty public safety band at 4.9 gigahertz, which is 50 megahertz. The commission in the 5.9 gigahertz uh, NPRM that we commented on, they're proposing to retain just 30 megahertz for uh, vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure safety signaling. They could potentially have even more there with better propagation um, because essentially both things are important, both safety and connectivity. And uh, uh, to the extent the commission can, you know, have it both ways for all of us, so much the better. So one last question on, on my end, which is, um, and then we'll, we'll still monitor if we can get a, a quick question in from another quick question in from the audience is, uh, and this is probably for, uh, uh, I guess I'll probably look to Paula and, and anyone else who wants to jump in is, today most Wi-Fi is operating just fine on 20 megahertz channels. Um, so, you know, coming back again, because I'm not sure how explicit this was is, is what is the practical importance of, of much wider 80 and 160 megahertz channels that could be available, um, you know, a single 160 at 5.9 or multiple contiguous 160 megahertz channels uh, at across the six gigahertz band. I mean, what is kind of the practical importance of, of having that kind of capacity? Yeah. Um so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and jump in. Um, you know, I, I think folks have, across sort of all the three different sort of use cases, you know, um, very low power, indoor uh, low power, and uh, the sort of full power, standard power outdoor, um, you know, you, you'll have scenarios like uh, being able to, to leverage uh, uh, the spectrum to do things like virtual reality, um, you know, being able to uh, um, leverage really high bandwidth applications that you, you really can't do that today, at least over any real distances. Um, so so it, it, it essentially, without it, there's just simply a gap in being able to do that, uh, at least being able to do it in, in a seamless way in terms of leveraging broadband today. You might be able to do it on your mobile network, but once you leave that ne that network, over time, you know, as five G is deployed, you'll you'll be able to do it on your mobile network. But once you leave that network, it becomes uh, more challenging to do. And we live today in a very portable and mobile manner, so we're no longer sort of tied to that wire that you would you would need if you were going to use kind of that the high bandwidth. Um, you know, I know that folks have talked about sort of wearable type scenarios um, uh, a, as well, and so which require some of some of those experiences require higher bandwidth. And uh, you know, at least in rural areas, you you hear folks talk about things like precision agriculture, some of which can be done, and and, and frankly, IoT generally, some of which can be done with very uh, you know, with, with small bandwidth, but sometimes uh, some scenarios will need a higher bandwidth. 
And so th those are the kinds of opportunities that I think uh, six gigahertz will probably be able to afford if it's, if it's adopted. Yeah, not to mention, as I think one of the commissioners said earlier, the innovation that we can't imagine today. Because uh, when Wi-Fi started 20 years ago, it was in a junk band um, and nobody appreciated what it could turn into. Um, any final thoughts from anyone else on the panel? Um, AJ, John, or Rosa? Um, anything you haven't said? Okay. Well, yeah, we're right at time, so, um, and there's no uh, burning questions, so we can um, wrap it up. I want to thank, uh, again, thank John, Paula, Rosa, and AJ for uh, staying with us this whole time and, and participating and being flexible as we move to uh, a virtual event. And to all of you out there, uh, please stay safe, uh, stay, uh, um, basically stay home, I think, for a while. <laughs> and uh, we'll hopefully get through this quickly. So uh, uh, the best to all of you and uh, we'll see you again, probably online and then in person soon. Thank you, thank Michael, you so and thank you for the emerging technology to have this important conversation. Yes, thank you so much.